Pokemon TCG sets are just too big these days. I'm sure that's something all TCG players and collectors have all heard or thought. But is it actually true? Has there been a slow trend of card sets getting bigger or has it been a modern thing? And are people over exaggerating? I wanted to find out. So this is a graph of all the main Pokemon card sets. As we go up the graph, the number of cards that was in that set increases. So at the bottom we have sets like Jungle, Fossil and Neo Revelation and many other older sets. As we start to creep to the right, we start to see some of the gym sets. The EX sets start to set a precedent where sets would have 100 cards or so. And this lasted up until the Diamond and Pearl era where it started to creep upwards, getting slowly towards the 130 cards a set mark. But this was balanced with a few sets like Majestic Dawn still having the old norm of around 100 cards a set. But we can still start to see a little trend here. As we started to get to black and white and X and Y, it started to trend upwards a tiny bit, but there were some massive discrepancies like Primal Clash and Breakthrough. But then, oh boy, it starts to get silly because from Sun and Moon onwards is when it starts to get out of control. Just look at this now. This sharp trend upwards is pretty insane. With sets in the Sun and Moon era and Sword and Shield having around 200 cards a set or so average. Pretty much double what sets used to have back in the day. And that's not even including secret rares. But luckily Scarlet and Violet won't have any rainbow rares so that should make it easier to collect and play. But for now sets are obscenely large. Almost as obscene as how big Pokemon TCG events are getting these days. Back in 2014, the average event attendance was 328 Masters. And to be honest, that's heavily skewed due to Limitless only tracking Nationals back then and the US National was around 900 Masters, while the EU ones were hovering around the mid 100s. But just stick with me here. 2015 averaged 329, an increase of one Master per event. And in 2016, it was 379. And to be fair, from 2016 to 2019, the average stayed around the same. And that was until 2020, where the few events that did still run were ravaged by people who couldn't travel due to airline restrictions. And this led to an average of 269. And after that, we had no IRL Pokemon for two years. But then when we were given events again in 2022, the average master attendance shot up all the way to 614. And that's even with some of the EU events like EUIC being heavily restricted still. And it gets better because then if you was to isolate the regionals after the last world championships, the average masters attendance shoots up to 821. And with some events like Orlando just gone having close to 1,500 players, this is showing no sign of slowing down. But with this increase of almost 300% of average attendance, the prizing offered hasn't changed at all. Meaning that someone that gets a top 32 placement now from a 1,500 player regional still gets the same prizing as you would have done all the way back in 2018 when average attendance was in the 300s. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? But what you might not know is that these events still have a lot of catching up to do since in Japan the Champions League events have been known to have over 3,000 players. Imagine winning one of them. The biggest events we have over here are the internationals. There are four of these in the season and these offer the most amount of prizing and CP too. These are very prestigious with one happening in each region each year. EUIC, OCIC, LAIC and NAIC. As of recording we have had 17 international championships so far. But what trends or patterns can we see from the winners of these prestigious events? Well I took a look at all the previous international winners and ran the numbers and there were some fun conclusions. What have I told you there is a 47% chance of an international championship being won by one of three people. Yep that's right before you even step foot in the arena it's almost a 50-50 chance that we already know who the winner will be. But who are these three people? Well, Gustavo Wada and Stefan Ivanov both have already won two ICs already. The third person is Tord Reklev, who has a silly four international wins already, one in each region. Not only that, but Tord actually has a 25% chance to win the IC himself. One man against the world, and he wins 25% of the time. And the other 25% of the time, his two mates win. Just think how much money they've earned playing Pokemon. That's right, everyone's favourite prize, money especially when you earn it by playing Pokemon cards. But what card has earned the player base the most money? 
or what card has cost Pokemon the most money? Well, here's a graph of some of the main archetypes I could find this data on. What card do you think is going to be at the top? Towards the bottom, we have Leafy on VMAX, Lost March, and Metagross GX. All great cards, but didn't earn the most money. As we get towards the middle, we see cards like Rayquaza, Baby Buzz, Guardian, and Rapid Strike Urshifu. Don't forget some of these cards haven't rotated out yet so they still have time to earn more. As we start to get towards the upper echelons we have cards like Reshizard, Psychic Recharge Malamar, Mewtwo and Mew Tag Team and even Mew VMAX itself which is crazy to think about when you consider Mew still has a lot of format left to earn more money and it will still be pretty good. But the top 6 seem to be in a class of their own. Picarom and Garbodor are seen here, as well as Buzzworld GX. But $50,000 higher than all of them is Arceus V-Star. Who would have said that Arceus V-Star would be the second highest earning card of all time? There is one card higher than Arceus, and let me tell you, it's not even close. Can you guess what it is yet? Leave it in the comment. Okay, let's have a look. Zoroark with an extra $200,000 over Arceus 2. Do you think any card will catch it? I'm not sure. One format you can't play Zoroark in though is GLC, a format made by Andrew Mahome. It looks to make use of older, less powerful cards with a ban list and wall set to support it. For example, you can only play one copy of each card and there can't be any wall boxes as well. And when you consider that this format was made by one person, Andrew, he has done an extremely good job at marketing it and getting it out to the masses. I see GLC played all the time. But just how many players have played GLC? And how does that player count compare to other ways to play the Pokemon TCG? Well, I added up the players that have ever played in a GLC event online, courtesy of Play Limitless, and then made some rough estimates at how many people have played GLC events at regionals and internationals by consulting the man himself, Andrew. And I came to the conclusion that there have been 6,042 GLC attendees at GLC events ever since it started. And bear in mind it only started a couple years ago. Okay, that sounds good. But how does that compete against, let's say, the Relic of the Past expanded format? Well, if you were to add up all the players from expanded regionals back in the day, GLC matches up pretty well. Considering expanded had years and years of regional level events and GLC has only been going for a year or two. GLC being at roughly half the amount of all the expanded regional player base, I think in such a short time is crazy. If you were to add up the player base from all the limitless qualifiers, GLC smokes them by about 2,500 people. But to be fair, that's an online series. How about comparing GLC to let's say, world's attendees? Well, if you were to add up the world attendees from 2011 to 2022, GLC beats them by over 4,000. This last one though, I think this is the crazy one. And this is when I realized GLC is actually a massive format and Tricky Jim needs a pat on his back. Because if you were to add up all the players from the EU regionals and internats from 2022, GLC is just one player behind. Mad to think a fan-made format is gaining such traction. You absolutely love to see it. GLC stops you playing strong cards, so the format doesn't get dominated by the most oppressive cards you've ever seen. But in TCG history, what have been the most oppressive cards? Well, I wanted to find out. So here's a graph that shows certain archetypes and their biggest percentage of day two slots at an event. So here, if we look at Mega Manetric, its biggest percentage of a day two was 15%. And as we move up the graph, you can see some of the old greats, such as Volcanion, Mega Mewtwo, Darkrai, and Toad, all hovering around 20%. As we get into the 30s, we start to see some more powerful cards, such as Palkia, Virgin, and Pyro. Don't forget, some of the data for these older archetypes is a little bit sketchy, so this is more of a guide than it is gospel. As you get to the 40s and 50s, the poster boys of formats are around, such as Buzzwall, Mew, Plasma, Gardevoir, the late 50s are occupied by some of the most crazy cards ever seen, such as Arceus, Zorua. And look at that, Lugia V-Star is there as well, what a shock. So does that make Lugia the most dominant deck of all time? Well, no actually. There was one more card, an attacker that made you shake in your boots if you were playing against it. An attacker that single-handedly changed how decks were built and played, pretty much overnight too. Can you guess what it is? Older players already know what I'm talking about. 
Yep, that's right. If we move up the graph, you can see Trash Lance Garbador really giving people the business in Seattle with a 75% mark in day two. Absolutely crazy. But let's have a little bit of fun with this last one. What is the waifu tax? The idea that trading cards or products are often more expensive if they depict a female on them. If you are familiar with the Charizard tax, then this is a very similar idea. But it's very easy to prove if the Charizard tax is real. I mean, look how expensive these bad boys are. But there isn't any concrete data on the waifu tax, at least in Pokemon. Just anecdotal evidence. So I got to work because I wanted to see if this is real. So I found out the average price of all the full art supporters from the Sword and Shield block. And then working out the average price if the card had exclusively a male or exclusively a female on them. Trainer gallery cards were not included even if they did have a female on them because I didn't want the Pokemon on them to potentially affect the experiment such as this Garchomp for example. And here are the results. So the average price of a full art Sword and Shield supporter that has a male on it exclusively is $4.58. For the most part, they were filled with cheap cards such as Kindler and Barry going for around $1 or $2 respectively. And there were only a few playable outliers that would drag the price up, such as Raihan, Colrus and Giovanni. But let me know in the comments if you think the waifu tax is going to be real. Here we go. The average price for a full art sword and shield supporter that has exclusively a female on it is $14.20. That's almost a 300% increase. And when you see it on a graph like this, it looks absolutely obscene. Like the video if you like the video. Subscribe if you want to see more and I'll see you all next time.